And without as little a fanfare as possible, or with as little as fanfare as possible, we are live. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages? Uh, oh, hang on, water delivery. Oh, and I got fucking, what's this? Kyle's out of his fucking mind. Thanks. Let's go. The things we do. What's going on? What? Why? Why is everybody live on this thing? This is Zoom, right? No, this is a Facebook live video, and I'm I'm live on YouTube up here. So you guys are. So look, there's everybody. So the the you got to go to Zoom, go to the login information that I sent in the message with the username and PIN number, and that'll get you on the Zoom call and live. You know, right. you know, do that. Yeah, I got, I got Zoom up, so I just put the six 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 four two zero oh, six nine number. Oh man, Kyle, we're, we're we're live. You just gave the pin number to the world. Oh man. <laughs> so let's see if anybody's gonna hack in. But those numbers I sent you, there's two numbers. Uh, one of the the top one is the room number. The second one is the okay. pin number. So. <laughs> so let's try that and we're going to get everybody over there so stand by one moment and all right fucking I, I saw you were in there dennis so you just go back to what you were doing i'm getting off this call so i can talk to the people who are looking at me wondering what the fuck's going on oh so that that started off uh swimmingly did it not um so <laughs> This whole technology thing is is confusing. I'm a caveman. These things scary and confusing. Let me uh, swap over. Oh, Lord have mercy. So <laughs> for anybody who just didn't know what, what just happened, I, I sent out a group message to the participants of this tonight to come on to a Zoom. So, okay, I got, I got Dennis is in the waiting room. I got Clark in the waiting room. I got Jessica in the waiting room. I'm just waiting for Kyle. Um, and yeah, they, they decided to do a, a call on Facebook, which does me no good. Um, but that's all right. That's all right. We, we regroup. Uh, so, so anyway, with, uh, with as little a fanfare as possible, I guess not, we're, we're going to start this up. The, uh, I, I, I started last week doing a show about the, let me move this in a little bit because I sounding like shit and I'm far away from the mic. So here we go. So anyway, so I started last week and did a show where comedians came on and told the aristocrats joke. And if you missed it last week, it's actually on the FUBAR Weekly channel. You can pop over there. Oh, uh, while I'm on that, uh, if you're not subscribed to that, subscribe to that, subscribe to this channel, like it, share it, uh, you know, spread the love, share the love, and uh, get the word out of the awesome things that we're doing. So last week we did the aristocrats joke where uh, I had comedians come on and tell the dirtiest joke ever conceived uh, that's never been told on stage or seldom is told on stage. Um, and I figured, well, I want to do something different, but I also want to uh, separate it from the FUBAR Weekly Show. So that's why I'm doing it on my uh, personal Facebook channel, or I'm sorry, YouTube channel. Um, and I'm going to do, I'm going to do a show until this whole quarantine is over. Uh, maybe even continue on if it's, if we're having fun with it. And we're going to do a different topic every week. It's not always going to be comedy related. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about the history of where it's been, knocking shit over, where it's been and where, uh, where we think it's going to go. Uh, especially given the changes uh, to, to our our world as as comedians that this uh, this whole uh, COVID nineteen has brought about, um, I can't think of anyone I know of that's been on stage since March. Uh, we've all kind of been sitting at home stewing, hopefully writing new material, which is always okay. So I got Kyle, Jessica, Dennis, Clark, uh, Cl Clark quit, I guess. Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so. Let's get this started. I'm going to start bringing everybody in. Um, these comedians that, that I'm bringing in are friends of mine. I've performed with all of them. Um, and I will introduce them as we go. So we'll, we'll, start with, uh, we'll, we'll start with introducing Dennis Newman. Dennis Newman's the first comedian coming in. He'll be popping up once it feeds. Uh, Dennis didn't send me his intro information. So he's a sexy-ass motherfucker with a beard uh, and a beautiful bald head. He is from New York. Uh, hell of a nice guy. 
he, he used to have two uh two podcasts was it uh cool cats pinups and comics or something like that Pin -ups, cool cats comics there we go and then the newman show uh you're on hiatus so what what, what happened with that yeah just uh life got busy so i just took a break with everything it happens man i get it uh welcome you're the fur you're the first one i brought in um i'm gonna bring in uh i'll bring in kyle now kyle also did not send me a, an intro so Kyle Neely is a second comedian coming in. He is originally from uh, Georgia, moved down to Tampa, started his comedy career here in Tampa, and has since moved uh, to Los Angeles. Uh, he's good looking, son. Look at that. <laughs> that. He's not, it's not, it's not him right now. That's his, that's his headshot. He's going to be hopefully popping. You got to click start video, Kyle, if you can hear me. Where is he? Yeah, there in. he is. Oh, man. Hey, he's in. All right. Uh, so this is this is Kyle Neely, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, like I said, he's from Georgia. Moved down here to well, you're originally from Georgia, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. He came down here to Tampa. Was here for a while. Got his comedy career kicked off, and has moved on to the bigger and better things in Los Angeles. Man, seems like you're out. You're hustling out there, man. Uh yeah. You have to. You have no have no choice but to do it. <laughs> yeah and you know from what i've seen i mean a lot of guys go out there and they don't have the hustle and they come they turn around come right the fuck back yeah you know? yeah it's um it's 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 it can be a scary place i mean it's you just have to be like the stuff we used to talk about you have to be like on your business out here because um if if not then you just not gonna have any opportunities you, you'll be coming back yeah well like i said you you seem to be uh hustling pretty hardcore um, yeah. I don't know where Clark went. I don't know where Jessica went. The hell, man! They said they were in the rating room, but I don't know they, where. Well, they were. Uh, then they then they dropped off. Hang on. What's going? On? Kyle says he got in. Uh. Oh, there she is. All right. So uh, let me bring in Miss Jessica Stern. Admit one. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Stern. If you caught the Aristocrat show I did on the Food Bar channel last week, Jessica Stern was on it. Um, she is. Originally from New York, currently residing here in Tampa. She's a hilarious comedian and an absolute sweetheart. Uh, where did her intro go? I kind of half-assed some stuff tonight. So, so, so her TV credits include MTV and the Wendy Williams Show. Um, funny gal, awesome gal, silly gal. Kicked ass in the aristocrats last week. Jessica Stern, as soon as she figures out where the video button is. So, <laughs> oh, so just like your your Zoom meetings, there she is. So just like the Zoom meetings you guys do at work, you know, the, out in listener land that you do at work where everything's fucked up and weird shit happens and no one knows what's going on. This is what we do, too. So it's all good. <laughs> Jessica, what's going on? Hon? Woo, nothing. Bored. Quarantine. <clears throat> excited to be here on the show. History of comedy. Let's get historical. Yep. We get We're going to make comedy history. Like, yeah, copy take history. that how you want. Like a... Uh, like a better version of Schoolhouse Rock with titties. Ooh, hey. Yeah, there you go. I got titties too, so. You do. I've sucked them. They're great. I only got like two hairs, just two hairs. That's Clean. it. That's because I shave them. Those are the two I miss. Dennis has some nice titties. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Kyle looks like he's lost weight, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've lost weight out here. I have to uh, patrol around and move a little bit more than I was. So, yeah, I've, I've lost my titties. <laughs> and, and speaking of titties, when, when I don't know what happened to Clark. He was in the waiting room, and then he disappeared. <laughs> so Clark is the old man we got on the panel tonight. So chances are they were, I don't know, they, they may have been giving out pudding over at the senior center. I don't know. <laughs> so so I guess we'll, we'll jump into it when I see him pop into the waiting room. I'll, uh, I'll bring him in. So cheers to you guys for, uh, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Oh, What's there? Oh, there he is. There he is. Let, let me let me do an intro to Clark. We we'll actually pull up Clark's thing, and then I will introduce him. When you guys were in the waiting room, because I never can you hear what I'm saying while you're in the waiting room? Nope. Nah. It's just nothing. Ah, shit. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I figured you like get a preview, you'd be able to hear when I was bringing you on. That kind of that kind of sucks. All right. So, our yes. final panelist for the evening, uh, Mr. Clark Brooks. He is originally from. Benton Harbor, Michigan. He is now here in Tampa. He is uh, a writer for Identity Tampa Bay, and he is part of the greatest fake news channel as uh, as rated by Better Homes and Gardens magazine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome for the beautiful, the lovely, what the fuck just happened, 
<laughs> I hit admit, and as soon as I hit admit, he disappeared. Clark, I, what the fuck? Oh, water. I the other bottle. Oh no! I, what? Do you, hang on. I got my my bartender's failing. You were supposed <laughs> to just bring me two bottles of water. You brought me a bottle of water and a beer, which was appreciated. Um, but for right now, I'm just gonna stick with the beer. So when I'm ready for another one, I'll uh, I'll hit you, dude. So anyway, so Clark, Clark what happened? <laughs> what happened? Oh no! This is. See, you know, again, I'm not very technological. I'm kind of, to, to, to use a horrible word that's offensive, I'm retarded, people, all right? <laughs> it's not offensive. Pops back in. Factual. <laughs> it's not offensive if it's factual. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is crazy. I, like, clicked to invite him in, and it was weird. Did you know he can't get on with a rotary phone? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Clark, waiting. It takes him an extra 10 minutes to do that. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me wait again. As soon, as soon as I see him, so when, when, I'm not going to do an intro. As soon as I see him, I'm just going to pop it up. So, you know, again, he's from Benton Harbor, Michigan, Tampa News Force, Identity Tampa Bay. Very nice guy. He's got a book out, uh, which he can talk about uh, later on. Um, this is so cool. fucking weird. This technology, man. So did you guys do any research for this? Or are you just going to fucking wing it like me? Yes. Gonna wing it. <laughs> That's the way I like it. Look. Um hang on. I can't I can't talk in text. It's like I can't drive in. I can drive in text. I'm actually I'm really good at that. I don't want to admit to it, but I'm I'm really good at that. Yes. <laughs> you in. Killing it. Hi. Again. Okay, here we go. So so anyway. So um you know, the re re reason why I want to bring this in is just to talk about as comedians what we see. Um, you know, what, what we've been through uh, in the past, what we've learned from the past, because comedy's got a pretty deep and uh, occasionally very seedy uh, history uh, and, and where it's going. And I wanted to try and get people of, uh, you know, with different points of view than mine. All right. So that's that's why you're here. That's why I've gathered you all here today. Actually, I just gathered you guys to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Looking good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you must be drunk. So, <laughs> so, so while, we, while we wait for Clark, what's that? What'd you say? I said, what happens in quarantine stays in quarantine. That's true. Except for herpes. That'll follow you the fuck everywhere. <laughs> um, so, you know, Can you give yourself herpes? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wear a rubber glove just in case because it helps the whole fist slide up there easy. <laughs> The good news, you can only get it once, so. That's true. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to start with Kyle, because I haven't seen you. I haven't really talked to you in a long time, and I miss you, you bastard. Um, so so, so how, for, first of all, how, how much different are you seeing it and feeling it in L.A. versus uh, Tampa, aside from the, the difference in the, in the level of hustle? Um, it's, it's just, to, to be honest with you, a lot of people are scared of L.A., you know, comics, you know, from, you know, Tampa, from where I started out at. And it's a lot of people in L.A. Yes, there's a million comics. There's 10 million actors. It's um, so the, the big difference that I've seen is that a lot of myths that I had about L.A. prior to coming um, out here um, was were dis demystified. Certain things I thought were true weren't true. Um the big, the big difference, I guess, what could separate you or what you would have to notice is that um, mostly in L.A., um, people, you know, comics are hoping for a bigger entity to deal with them. Um, it's basically based on if you have your own stuff together. Um, either you've got your own following, your own audience, some kind of product, some kind of something going on. And um, in L.A., it's like you can do comedy like maybe, you know, 10, 20 percent of the time, but a lot of your time is going to be uh, uh, could be spent running around networking, trying to get your name out there, your project out there, whatever you're doing. So, so what? So what you're saying is that you have to spend as much time and effort on the business half of show business as you do your set. Fucking uh, weird. To be honest man. with you, out, out here more. I mean, out here yeah. more because because I, I I live you know by the comedy store. Like I would walk up there and, and being in the comedy store and waiting to get on the open mic and then hoping to get on kill tony and all of that stuff did um, you find my name on the wall at the store 
Uh, no, I snook and wrote mine on there. They just hadn't figured it out yet. So, yeah, I was just uh, going to say, my name's not the fuck on there. So <laughs> all of us. So <laughs> when, when, next time you're walking past, take a white Sharpie. You're going to write Dennis's name. You're going to write Jessica's name. You're going to put, put all our names yeah. on there. Of course. Because yeah. I'm not going to fucking get out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, De- De- Dennis... De- Dennis is from New York. I've, I've done a bunch oh, of shows with that. Actually, the very first show I did at Broadway Comedy Club, Dennis was there for. He probably doesn't remember. Um, I remember. Yeah, we had to blow each other to get on stage. It was weird. We didn't have to blow the <laughs> producer or the club owner. We had to blow each other. And they watched. It was weird. But they threw pennies at us. <laughs> so it was good. <laughs> but, and, and Jessica's from New York as well. We've never done a show in New York. We've done tons of shows down here. We got to get. We, we got to plan a, a, a thing up there and, and get together and do it up there. But. Yeah. You know, the, bo- both Jessica and and, and, uh, and Dennis will tell you the, the hustle factor in New York is very similar to the way it is in L.A. You have yeah. to you have to be getting out. You can't just you can't just be just be funny. You can't just, you know, should keep showing up to the same club to get on. You need to you need to diversify the shit out of what you're doing, you know. Yeah. And, and that the hustle is real. And that's that's kind of where I'm, you know, going to come around to i didn't want to make this necessarily a, a history lesson on on stand-up comedy because you know if you want to if you want to learn the, the whole story if people want to learn the whole story they can fucking google it like i did in in some half ass preparation for the show but the biggest thing that that, that get that applies to me and, and really applies to us now is you know where comedy's been recently especially in our lifetimes um you know censorship is is a big thing and Kyle, when, when I remember when you, you know, you, you were doing, you were doing great. You were doing shows down here and you did one show for me at O'Brien's. You remember that show where you just, you just, you yeah. almost flipped the switch and you tried going a lot more raw and a lot more dirty. And how yeah. was the reception for that from that? You know, how, how do you think the crowd took uh, that, though, especially the people that knew you? I, it was, it, it's like a left turn. I mean, you know, cause you know, at that time, you know, being really young and I'm, you know, I still consider myself a beginner, but uh, being a, a real beginner at that time, you know, honestly, you know, it was a left turn for people because, you know, you're just young I'm, at that time, just being young and trying to experiment and see what works. And then you're getting, you got a thousand influences on you from as a new comic to, Oh, you need to be clean cut to, I want to get up here and say the N word a hundred times. You know? <laughs> and, and let me tell you, watching you do that, like it was fun. It was funny, but I think what made it less funny is the fact that I, you know, I knew you, and, and I'm used. To, yeah. I was used to your comedy, and you weren't. You you were never dirty up to that point. I mean, you drop a you you drop some words here and there, but you weren't like like that kind of raw. And like right after right. that show, I told you it's not. That's not you. It's not. You know, your personality, your demeanor, it just didn't fit. And then you went pretty clean and you started seeing progress, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it gives you more avenues, of, you know, being clean, just just in, in general anywhere, whether it's L.A. Or, or Florida, you know, it just it's a little bit easier for you to deal with a crowd or somebody that's trying to book you. You know, it just helped us in that. Don't, you don't have to do it, but it does open more doors, you know, the more more you can deal with more people with your material yeah and and and, you know again it was you know it it shocked me man not very little shocks me like i've seen (laughs) i've seen some shit man but that shocked me um (laughs) but 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 going on that you know i i keep making jokes that lenny bruce died for our sins Mm -hmm. you know you know and if uh, you know i hope i hope you guys are, are familiar with who lenny bruce is and like Looking back now and listening to his stand up, I can see the appeal at the time. I don't find him incredibly funny. I find him humorous. I find it witty. I find it, you know, you know, a great, you know, scathing review of, of, uh, of the social situation at the time. But I don't find him that funny. But when you look at what he got arrested for, you know, mm-hmm. he got arrested for saying cocksucker on stage in San Francisco. He yeah. got arrested. I think it was Chicago. He got arrested for saying schmuck. You know how many fucking times I call my kids schmucks? Like, <laughs> for the for those not I heard involved in the was schmuck until he was five years old. <laughs> what, wait, what was that? I said your son told me he thought his name was schmuck until he was five. <laughs> That's true, and then it changed to asshole, and it confused the shit out of him. But, but you know, Je- Jessica, what is a schmuck? A schmuck is a Jewish Yiddish term for an idiot. You're just an idiot, man. You're schmuck. You're dumb. You're fucking up. <laughs> but what's the literal? Do you know what the literal term, like what a schmuck literally is? Um, 
No, I guess I just know the Yiddish of it. What else do you mean? It's actually, the, it actually means penis. Oh, does it? That's fun. Seriously, okay. yeah, see? <laughs> but just how, just how if somebody's being dumb, we call him a dick? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, yeah. but think about that. I mean, you know, getting arrested for calling someone a schmuck <laughs> it's it's mind-boggling in in 2020 you know mm -hmm. um he, is it though well and, and the, the reason why i ask is because dave Chappelle, with a lot of people you can't even say anything you used to be able to say five ten years ago without mm -hmm. getting heat and that's what i was going to get to so so he gets arrested for that you know a few years later he gets arrested for saying schmuck you know, he gets arrested for saying cocksucker. Then he got, I forget what he got arrested for in New York, but he got arrested in New York. Actually, when he got arrested in, in New York, I think it was New York, Carlin got arrested the same night mm -hmm. because Car they, they, they were asking everybody for their ID. And Carlin told the cops, I don't believe in government ID. So they arrested him too. But then Carlin got arrested in 72 for saying the seven dirty words. Well, Most of Carlin was a big Lenny Bruce fan. He used to follow him around. Yeah. And from what I was told, he actually told Lenny Bruce he wanted to be arrested with him. And Lenny's like, why? He's like, you're, saying, <laughs> you're, you're fighting for us. You're my fucking I'm hero, fighting. man. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he's at, you know, he was absolutely right. Lenny Bruce was fighting for him. Whether you find Lenny Bruce's comedy funny nowadays, it's irrelevant. It's, it's the, the, the path he blew down. Mm -hmm. You know, think about it this way. George Carlin was arrested in 1972 for saying the seven dirty words. Fuck shit, piss, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. In 1983, Eddie Murphy did Delirious. And, and he used every one of those words and more. <laughs> he used every one of those words, and he invented some fucking words, I think, for that one. But, it, you know, but it was like night and day. Like, he, he was able to say all that and, and got, oh, hang on, Clark is here. Admit, let's see if this works. Fingers crossed for Clark Brooks. <gasps> hey. Oh, oh, is it going to work? Is it going to work? It's fucking Clark Brooks. Yes. Clark, can you hear us? For, uh, <laughs> hearing time for closing remarks. Uh, no, no, you're actually, uh, we, we were just talking about, uh, you know, comedy from back in, in, in your uh, teen years with, uh, with uh, George Carlin getting arrested and Lenny Bruce getting arrested. And, uh, <laughs> Eddie Murphy saying whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> yeah, two of those three are before my time, but yeah, those things happen. They are? No, I'm just kidding. Clark, Clark is not as old as I tell him he is all the time. <laughs> we did, we did your intro already. I was at 8 o'clock, though. That's true. We did your intro early, but I'll refresh. From Benton Harbor, Good. Michigan, writer for Tampa, Identity Tampa Bay, one of the uh, contributors and, and editors, I guess, for uh, Tampa News Force, the greatest fake news site since CNN, uh, right. Mr. Clark Brooks. Hello. <laughs> what, what was going? Was it just not connecting? It kept saying the host will let you in in a minute, and then nothing happened. I clicked let you in, and it just, you disappeared. I don't know. Whoa. I don't to tell you. Ma ma imagine if we were actually running a real business for this. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, like we were just catching up on, on, on the censorship end of things and how, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you go from 1972, George Carlin getting locked up for saying the seven dirty words to 1983, um, Eddie Murphy recording Delirious. And even before that, um, Richard Pryor, uh, you know, w was dirty yeah. in, through, through the mid to late 70s. Red Fox. Um, yeah. Buddy Hackett. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how much things have evolved. And now what Dennis had said was that, you know, we're kind of going back to that almost Puritan can't say this, can't say that. I'm a big fan of, you know, comedians should be able to make fun of anything they want and say anything they want. They have to deal with the repercussions, but they can. It shouldn't be illegal. And Raj, let me jump in about censorship because I did, I studied, I read up for today's show. I got all my history of ladies of comedy for you guys and it's such bullshit it's so unrealistic to try to censor uh, women in comedy because I tell you Lucille Ball in her show back in the day she was breaking just because she was talking about pregnancy in I want to I want to be the dick who's going to say it you mean women are funny <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding oh is not watching if my pussy's watching it doesn't work <laughs> uh gotta put gotta put blinders on 
but, but but you're right, and 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 you you me and you had talked about Joan Rivers. Oh yeah, you know, absolute heat because she wanted to perform while pregnant. They had a really big problem with it. Pregnancy back in the fifties, sixties, seventies was a problem on television, and that's not a curse. That's not a dirty word. That's a natural part of life. Look, they couldn't even sleep next to each other. They had to have the bed separated by a nightstand on the shows. Yeah, and we all know that they were fucking being dirty and shit. Oh, we yeah. all know that. Oh, yeah. I heard the Dirty Sanchez came from them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, no. now, Clark, when did you start When did you start doing comedy? Uh, I'm about six years in now. Okay, yeah. so you're, 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 you're relatively new to comedy, but you've been around. Yeah. You, you, you've been around. You were a projectionist for a long time, and, you know, yeah. so you've you've seen the goings on you've seen the changes i mean you're you're really not that much older than me well and go back and watch an old marx brother oh yeah he froze uh oh god uh -oh. i mean you know i mean it's all okay. you clark, find a you way need, clark you keep freezing up you need to get off in north nebraska all right <laughs> i don't know what to tell you man <laughs> no, I know. But I'll just yes and no answers, I guess. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but no, I, you know, Marx Brothers, you're absolutely right. Um, they got away with a lot. They got away with a lot, but what they did wasn't as overt as, you know, saying cocksucker just outright. It was a little bit right. more disguised, which would obviously, you know, they, they'd be able to get away with it. And, you know, another thing that uh, that they put in uh, in Lenny Bruce's arrest when he got arrested in San Francisco was another part of his bit was where he said that, uh, you know, talking about to come to is a preposition and come as a verb. And they considered that obscene. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I, what I was trying to say is that uh, comedians job has always been to subvert whatever the standards are for society. Sometimes yes. you have to be a little more over the top sometimes you have to be a little more subtle but that's the comedian's job you know society's always going to change back and forth and it's the comedian's job to like get out in front of that and figure out how to how to be subversive in that in that way a absolutely and and you know whether you do it covertly or overtly really just will depend on the comedian gilbert yeah. godfrey and we talked about it last week gilbert godfrey like two weeks after september 11th during the roast of i think hefner goes out and starts telling September 11th jokes in New York City and it yeah. fucking bombed. So, yeah, you can make that joke, but whether that joke hits and what the repercussions are, that's on the teller. Yeah. You know. And and the the comics that sit back and go, "Oh, I'm not allowed to do this anymore. I can't do it and comedy's dying." Well, it's your job to figure out how to do it. You know, things change. And uh, you got to go with the flow. You got to evolve or die. Everybody's afraid now to become that martyr, that that, that symbol of, you know, of a well, movement that, uh, that 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 Lenny Bruce was. I don't and think so, because if you looked at um, Bill Burr's last special and Dave Chappelle's last special, they took this head on. I got to think with they're you. paving the way for Eddie Murphy to come back and, and everybody else to do their thing again. Dave Chappelle's special was absolutely fucking brilliant. So was Bill Burr's. I, I could I, I, I watched, I think, the first like 20 minutes and I shut it off. And I think what, really? what annoyed me was he would the jokes he was telling were about, you know, American life. But he was telling the jokes in England. And that, yeah. that was kind of like, you know, to me, if you're going to if you're going to rip on, on on Americans, which is fine, if it's funny, do it. But do it in America, man. Don't do it for the Brits. Do it here. And I kind of like, I didn't think it was hitting as well. I think I think uh, Chappelle's uh, set, uh, show was a, a thousand times better. It was he that was him at his absolute finest, I think. But the fact that they both went after topics that you're not allowed to talk about. And they both made the comment, hey, this is my last special, so enjoy it. And I think that's what their way of saying, hey, we don't care anymore. And, and and that's a, and that's what we need to get back to uh, a bit more is is telling jokes, whether they're dirty jokes using the shit language that I use or, you know, intelligent jokes that make people think in, in, in terms of like what Carlin did. I mean, Carlin was a 
an amazing wordsmith. Every line he said right. had like five different meanings, and it was just how far into it are you going to read? Yeah, and, and things in society tend to move like a pendulum. In the 50s, nobody could do anything. In the 60s, we decided we we're going to do everything. And then the 70s, it kind of balanced out. And now we're in another stage where it's it's swinging in a certain direction. And again, it's the comic's job to figure out how to get out in front of that. Absolutely. Absolutely is. And, and and there are times where, you know, whatever direction that pendulum is swinging, you know, it's almost on us to grab it, stop it and restart it. Yeah. You know, buck the system. Forget about what the trend is doing. Do something different. Right. And it's always some maverick that comes along. You know, it was uh, the Beatles and then it was Saturday Night Live. And, you know, it'll be somebody else, you know, well, whoever Saturday that Saturday Night Live stole their shit from National Lampoon. Sure. Well, sure. Yeah, <laughs> they, they took all the they're good writers. They took all the good actors from Second City and, uh, you know, they took the writers from Harvard and uh, they, they made the dream team. Yeah. But people who tried to come after that, there were weak comparisons that followed in their shadow. But, you know, it's always somebody will be a trendsetter at some point. Somebody will step forward and everybody will be like, oh, this is the new rock and roll. And it's like, well, you know, it's destined for somebody like that to come along. You know, and, and the, the, the flip side is, you know, coming along with, you know, if somebody were to try and, and do a new, quote unquote, new Saturday Night Live and try and put together that that dream team of, the best available writers and the best available actors and improv actors from whatever yeah. group, you know, if you try now, it's, you almost have to pander to every, you know, special interest that, Oh, we can't offend these people. Uh, if we say this, we're going to offend them. Chappelle, uh, you know, touched on that when he was talking about the dealing with the censor for, for Chappelle show. Where, yeah. where exactly. And the, you know, to do what Saturday night live did, you know, back then to try and do that today, I don't, I, I can't see, I see too many people getting offended and the whole project getting shut down. Well, it probably won't happen on network television, but True. it'll happen on YouTube or TikTok or something like that. And for all we know, they're already out there. Yeah, that, that, that that's true. And it's, it's just a matter of finding them and get, or get, having them get found and, and coming to the public light before everybody shuts him down for this guy yeah. he said this and he posted this back in you know in 2010 he posted something that was moderately offensive whether it was funny or not is is irrelevant but you mm -hmm. know dig, digging into people's past to try and, and pull up shit like i mean just after this show alone i probably won't be able to ever get booked on saturday night live i mean <laughs> probably has to do with the fact that i'm not that funny but you know and saturday night not it used to be 40 years ago they were all about let's take down the system and you had chevy chase wouldn't even put on makeup to play gerald ford and now the celebrity <laughs> importance are you know require intricate makeup and prosthetics to look as much like the person as possible and they have all this high production value and they're selling snow tires and light beer when you know? uh when, when people ask how old i am i always tell them i'm old enough to remember when saturday night live was funny <laughs> Damn, I didn't know you were that old. <laughs> you look good at your age. What was it like to so go to Tom Bibley, Raj? <laughs> yeah, we say, good. look. I think it's still funny. I just think their their mission is different, and they're good at what they do now. But it's different than what they set out with. So it, it's a different kind of funny. Like back then, it was yeah. it was like gut busting, actual laugh out loud funny. Now it's like eh, that's amusing. See, the yeah. problem is I, I think they're falling way too much into the PC cult to themselves. And if they find something that they're allowed to do that's funny, they beat it to death, like Trump. I mean, every week was the same Trump bit. It's not funny anymore. Yeah. At first it was funny. And then it was like, come on, am I, am I watching the same show I've been watching for the last six months? Do something different. Saturday yeah. Night Live used to be innovating. And now then, it's, and you know, and, and, and dealing the same thing with film. One of my favorite movies, and, and I think is one of the greatest comedy movies ever, was Blazing Saddles. Yes. Yeah. You, know, yes. You, you know, they say Blazing Saddles couldn't be made today. If you, if you think about it, you know the history and who wrote that movie and how it, that movie could absolutely be made today. If you understood the whole process of making that movie, like what went into it and who it was. Nobody realizes Richard Pryor was one of the writers. Mm -hmm. 
Amazing. Yeah, Mirage, things that were controversial back when Blazing Saddles were was made aren't controversial now. So you'd have to touch on new groundbreaking things, you know? Very, very true. Very true. But I'm talking about just the, the concept of making a movie with that much, you know, offensive language, no matter who it's talking. About. I mean, if you look at that movie, it made fun of ever. I can't think of any group except for maybe the Pollocks who weren't made fun of in that movie. But but even True. then, and with that movie, the studios wouldn't let Mel Brooks cast Richard Pryor as the lead. Correct, because he was too controversial. Um, is that right. true? I heard he was cast, but he just wasn't showing up. Is that he was no, heavy that, that was their that was their fear was that he he had just gotten he just had I think it was right when he set himself on fire smoking crap. Yeah. And you know some of the some of the stuff he was saying and doing, and the fact that he was unreliable on set, they wanted to recast it. Because I heard and, they uh, went to Gene Wilder and asked him, "Is it okay?" if we get someone else to do this, because obviously those two are tight. And he yeah. said, no, I understand. Do what you got to do. Uh, the, the, the actor that played Lyle, one of the Cowboys, the one that uh, was t trying to get him to sing the song uh, in the beginning guy with the really nice teeth. Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about? Lee, uh, Lee, Terry, Terry Gilliam. No, that's, that's a guy from uh, something Gilliam or Liam or something like that. Anyway, he absolutely did not want to, he refused to take the role because of how, how, how often he had to say the N-word in the script as he was reading the script. Now, at the time, he was a Dallas City firefighter. Right. And mm -hmm. he completely was going to pass on the role because of the language. And then when they sat him down and explained the whole thing to him, you know, it, he, was on, he was on board. Because it was poking fun at something that people were scared to poke fun at. Also, Mel Brooks got a script into John Wayne's hands. And John Wayne said, there's no way I can do this movie. I'll be first in line to see it when it comes out, but I can't do this movie. So. See, I, I, that fact I didn't know. Another fun fact about that movie, uh, the whole thing with calling him uh, Hedy Lamar and Hedley Lamar. Yeah. Hedy Lamar actually sued them. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And Mel Brooks said, pay her. Just whatever she wants, just, just pay her. And the, right. line, the line where he says, hey, this is 1864. You can sue her. Yeah. They dropped that in as a thing for her. So as soon as he found that she was going to sue, he was pay her, pay her. It's not worth fighting. It's a funny joke. I'll tell you what, as funny as Richard Pryor was and his good chemistry that him and Gene Wilder had, Cleavon Little was perfect in that role. Oh, I absolutely. don't know if Richard could have done any better. No, and one of the best bits uh, in that movie, the, the, there's the one scene where Gene Wilder is talking to him and says, you know, these are you know, the, the, these are people of the land, the common clay of the new West, you know, morons <laughs> and cleave on little breaks. That break was not part of the script. He actually started laughing and it's such a perfect, pure moment of righteous comedy that it had to be left there. You couldn't, you couldn't replicate. It. He couldn't act right. that gig, that, that laugh. It was just perfect. Kyle, you still awake? Yeah, I'm here. All right, feel I'm, free to I'm jump list, in. I'm list, just listening and learning. Just jump, jump in, man. Don't, 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 don't wait for your turn. Just fucking your turn is when you say your turn is, man. Uh, See, I, I want to add in what you were saying though. Um, with the cancel culture and the PC culture nowadays, there's a big group, and actually, it's really not a big group. It's just a loud group that wants to be offended. So as soon as anything that would be oh, considered yeah. funny comes out, that all over it shuts down. It's a little different back then because it's true. Like anyone that we, any movie we looked at as great like that or any comic that we considered funny would never get a start today because of this group. You have to get oh, yeah. over that hump. So like what Clark was saying is right. You got to find that guy or that, that woman, or whatever, that's going to break it, but they got to get up to that level where people are going to care who they are. Exactly. And that's like, the hard like, part right now. Yeah, And that, that was the whole thing with the, the, the guy that uh, I can't remember his name. That was trying to, they, they cast him for Saturday Night Live. And then uh, they, the, they found yeah. the, the thing where he's talking about Chinese people, which was moderate. Was I mean, it was bad? mildly offensive. The, I've, the, the most offensive part is that the joke wasn't funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing. You can joke about anything you want. You just make sure it's funny or you're going to deal with the consequences right. of that. And, uh, Jerry you know. Seinfeld can't play colleges because he's too offensive. Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld is too offensive for colleges. Yeah, they didn't get his humor. They were, they were considering him offensive, so he said, "I'm not doing them anymore." 
I mean, Seinfeld I think it's a, the least controversial comic I think out there. Well, no, it's probably offensive because he's incredibly intellectual. I'm not actually a fan of Jerry Seinfeld stand up, probably because I'm, I'm stupid. Either, probably because I'm stupid. They, they, <laughs> but they, they trash like shows like Friends and Seinfeld now. They're offensive. They're racist. They're anti Semitic. They're this or that. Just well, things were just used to be funny. And that was it. The movie Revenge of the Nerds. You know, when you think about it on, on the, the general premise of the whole movie, it's it's that underdog story. You know, you got the powerful alpha betas against the, the weaker, nerdy trilams. And the whole story, like, it's like a great story until you get to the one scene in the moon bounce house where, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, fuck, uh, Carradine has sex with the cheerleader. And then she realizes that it's not her boyfriend. Like... That was straight up rape. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you think about it. And, you know, things like that. The, mo the movie Soul Man. Do you guys remember that one? That yeah. did hurt me, Thomas Howell, though. It, it did. But when you watch the movie and, you know, that's because it was the whole thing. The guy's playing blackface. Yeah. Can't do that. Not, not, wait a second. Why did he do that? Well, what was the, what was the underlying context of what he was doing? It was, he did it. You can't, that's it. You're done. Why? Why that, did he do blackface? What the fuck are you? The, well, the whole, did, did you ever see the movie, Jessica? What? Jessica, did you ever see the movie? No. The whole premise of the movie is this kid is trying to get into Harvard, but he, he, he doesn't quite have the grades. So he, he overdoses on tanning pills to make himself black, applies as an African-American and gets in. And then he's got to like live his life, but it's like a secret from his family. And it's a really kooky. I thought it was a funny premise. It was just a, a, the absurdity of it. And it, it, you're right. It did, I can't think of anything. C. Thomas Howell was in after that movie. Yeah. That hurt him. It didn't hurt Robert Downey Jr. Though. He wasn't in blackface. Yeah, he was Tropic Thunder. Oh, well, <laughs> the, tropic thought well, he was but right. he was a guy playing a guy in blackface so it was it was double absurdity yeah which does it make it any more or less funny not funny or offensive i don't know and, i thought it was funny is an act like that alone offensive or do you need intent behind it uh, it's always I, intent there's always what what what, what you saying kyle Oh no! I, I'm just. I think it's just like based on times because, like, I, I was when I was younger. Like one of the movies we watched was Soul Plane. Well, I went back a year ago and watched Soul Plane, and it's exorbitantly rate. I found it offensive. Now I'm like, wow, how did they get away with saying that? I, it's like every stereotype about black people is in in uh, Soul Plane. It's actually all the. And it's. I mean, it's number black people in the movie doing like exorbitantly offen offensive stuff. Was that the one with uh with, with Method Man and Red Man? Uh, no, yeah. that was how high. Uh, that's so how okay. That's Kevin that's Hart. Okay. Yeah, DL Hughley, all of these big comedians in, in the black community like did the one of the most racist films if you look at it now. I think it's just based on time certain things are acceptable in, in a certain time. You know, certain people are finding certain things. Oh, how could you say that or do that? I haven't seen that movie since, you know, probably since it came out. But yeah. was, you know, you said it was it was incredibly racist and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, overtly racist. But was it incredibly racist because it was being satirical about racism? Or was it just, you know, some fucking whitey wrote the whole fucking thing and it's just a scumbag of a human? You know, I, I, I don't remember. I, I don't know. I just think uh, and when I look back and saw it, I don't really get too heavy on the race thing. But when I look back and saw it, I was just like, how did I know if I were on set as bad as, you know, I, yeah, I, I would have liked to get a role in a movie or something. But even if I did the role, I, certain things that they did, I would have felt kind of scratching the back of my head when I walked off set about it. I'm like, dang, I just, you know, this, I, I, don't, I wouldn't feel good about it. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't the positive kind of satire like I'm gonna get you sucker. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. a great movie. Yeah, that was. It was. A good one. <laughs> it was. It's a thought, whatever happened to Keenan Ivory Wayne's. What's up, Clark? It's supposed to be like an African American equivalent of the airplane movies. It was supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know. Uh, 
I mean, what what made Airplane so fucking good had nothing to do with really who was cast aside from Leslie Nielsen. But uh, no, you know, I know. Was, but I thought that, it was- the writing, the writing of Airplane is really what put that movie so far over. And one thing actually uh, to touch on, Fred Willard, you know, just passed away, who is one of my favorite, you know, bit actor, come- you know, bit comedian parts. I mean, he actually was supposed to have gotten the role of Ted Stryker in Airplane. Really? I saw an interview. Yeah, he turned it down because he was wow. working on another project. And the, the interviewer asked him, like, well, aren't you are you upset that the movie became so huge and is so legendary and you weren't a part of you turn the role down. And he said, no, because if I was in it, it may not have been such a good hit because um, fuck, I can't remember. Robert Hayes was so good in yeah. the Ted striker role. He may not have been as good, but he also said, and this kind of struck me that every role he didn't get someone else got. So he was okay with that because he didn't get it. Somebody else is working. And, and that compassion for, you know, your fellow actors, it's, it's something you rarely see. A lot of time, it's just me, 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 fuck you, you. Yeah. See, I don't remember Soul Plane much either to get back to that, but I don't know if it was maybe trying to recreate the black exploitation films of, like, what I'm going to get you, Sucker kind of was doing too, where it was just over the top in your face to try to be funny. I don't know. I, I think it was just like like what Clark said. You know, my opinion, Airplane was written with skill and, and great humor and, and some thoughtfulness put by it. And like, in my opinion, Soul Plane, like, I mean, anybody of any race could have wrote Soul Plane, to be honest with you. Like, yeah. it's, it's full of stereotypes. It's like, oh, let's give some black people on the airplane. Let's put some rams on the airplane. Let's put some big booty holes on the plane. Let's pop bottles on the plane. Let's play hip hop. Let's make the guy get high in the front. We got to have a few cons in there too. And it's like, I can just yell out every, oh, we got to have a dude that doesn't play his child support on the plane. And it's just like, whatever stereotype about black people, you just throw it into the script. Then that's soul plane. Yeah. See, that's, you know, and, and that's what separated. Airplane was just, was perfect writing. I think you yeah. could have, re- you could recast airplane and just put different <laughs> quality actors in aside from right. Leslie Nielsen. And it would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, 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 you know, well, Air, airplane was a, a genre spoof at the, just after, just before airplane came out for whatever reason, there was a whole spate of stupid disaster movies oh, many yeah. of which took place on an airplane. And then there was earthquake and towering inferno. Well, and airplane that. itself was a, was a parody of a disaster movie, airport 75. Right. And there are right. some scenes in airplane that were essentially just reshot identically just with the humor added. Yeah. So somebody would have to come up with a parody of a specific pop culture and societal references, which is, that was the formula for Airplane. And Naked Gun. Naked Gun was parody of every TV cop show that ever existed. And people don't realize that was a television show before it was a movie. Yeah. 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 And and the, the television show was great. Do you remember one of the recurring gags on the television show was they always announced a celebrity guest star at the start of the show, and they were usually a dead body at a crime scene, like floating in a pool or something, and then you never saw them the rest of the episode. No, but that's fucking brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Oh, God. We, Clark. we need... Oh, go ahead. That I do remember. I'm old, remember? So. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You're quite old. Quite old. <laughs> quite old. Quite old. You're Clark, I'm so happy you brought up Second City. Let me jump in and say Clark is dope for bringing up Second City because people don't realize oh. how much Second City really changed comedy. There are so many writers um, on SNL, the actors on SNL back in the day, writers of big yeah. sitcoms. Second City really produced so many stand-up comics and writers that really changed the face of comedy and brought it forward at that time. And the precursor to... Um, uh, Second City was called Compass, I think, and Jerry Stiller yeah. was in Compass. So I just want to give a shout out and an RIP to Jerry Stiller because he was a big part of comedy history too. Oh yeah. Pour one out for, Myth- Pour one out for Ben Stiller's dad. RIP. Real sad. Yeah. I'm smiling. Yeah. Sad. <laughs> I look cute smiling. So. <laughs> there you go. As a and, comedy, and 
if you ever have the chance to go to Chicago, visit Second City and just walk in there and you'll feel like just the, the people that have graced that stage over the last 60, 70 years, you'll be blown away. They have the list of the alumni there. It's incredible. Well, and there are so many other comedians and comic talents that came out of Second City that weren't on Saturday Night Live. Rick Moranis uh, was Second yeah. City. And, you know, he dropped off. The, he had the, the you know thing go on in his, in his personal life. That's why he dropped out of the limelight. Actually, I didn't get to see it, but apparently somebody interviewed him recently. And, he, you know, he's got a big beard and stuff. But, you know, a, a lot more comedians came out of Second City than just the ones that went to Saturday Night Live. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the alumni list is like my Johnson, long and distinguished. <laughs> Ew. Ew. No, I had, it's my outboard motor for my boat, we perverts. <laughs> Gotta find an excuse to get that dick in there. <laughs> That's it. It's all about dick jokes with me, you know. I, I, I think they need more sketch comedy going on right now. Definitely. And, and, and good sketch, com sketch yeah. comedy that will be that, uh, you know, go back to Saturday Night Live and uh, oh, the early days of Saturday Night Live and really test the limits of morality if you will current morality if you will yeah well Saturday Night Live got a little too comfortable they need competition well when we get done here i don't know if you guys ever heard of him uh search youtube for a guy named brandon rogers and okay. he's doing some absolutely batshit insane sketch comedy where he plays multiple characters and you'll they're long sketches sometimes some of them are like 20 minutes long and you'll be five minutes in and it just gets weirder and weirder. And you go, what am I even watching? But it's hysterically funny. And it would never, you can't play it on TV. Brandon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I shall check that out. The name rings a bell, but uh, check it out. See, Roger, I don't know if you were going to go to this later. So I apologize for ruining your flow. I have but... no flow, man. Okay. Because I was just wondering, like, is there a future stand up right now? Especially what's going on. Between, between the cancel culture and the PC culture making it hard enough, now you have this worldwide pandemic where it was hard to get people into comedy clubs to begin with. You're not getting the spot unless you have five to ten friends who are going to show up every night. Is it time for a, a switch? Feeling, I have a feeling that once things go back or start getting back to normal, especially in, in, in places like New York and L.A. and Chicago that have a, a, a real, you know, um, you know, a crazy comedy scene. It's going to happen in Tampa as well. And, and other cities, you're going to have like a baby boom of comedy. You know, the, the, the biggest thing that, that comedians needed to do was write new material, not just coronavirus jokes, but you know, there's going to be, I, I, this is what this is my opinion. I think there's going to be a, a comedy baby boom. Uh, once they start going back to, normal. but would people go to a place like the little room? The problem with that is now the perception of being in close quarters with people. I think that's going to be the biggest, uh, biggest problem. What I'm looking to see, um, Vic D. Batetto, um, who's a dynamite fucking human being, aside from being a funny comedian. Um, yeah. Somebody came up with this concept. I think it's like Club Nowhere or uh, some, something like that, where they're selling tickets to an online, like almost a Zoom thing. But... When you sign in, from what from what I could tell, when you sign in, you're able to hear the comedians able to hear the audience. So as the audience reacts, the comic will be able to hear it. So you'll be able to hear and get some feedback because, I mean, I'm watching some of these people like Ben Bailey regularly does, uh, you know, stand up on a, on a Zoom call and it's just him and a camera and there's no there's no he's not getting any feedback off of what he's doing aside from a comment flow, and. I think that's going to make a big difference is being able to, to, to see that, uh, you know, to have that, that reaction. So what's going to happen. I think there's going to be a baby boom of, of sorts, but exactly how it's going to play out as far as people coming to see comedians and clubs, I think that's what might be changing. And w honestly, we're all just going to have to sit it out and see where it goes and, yeah, I think oh, it's just going to be hard for the beginning levels to get going. Once you have a name, you're Victor Potato, you're Sebastian Maniscalco, you're one of those guys, you're getting people at the show regardless. Oh, absolutely. Us? I don't know. Yeah, and that's a, that, that's the thing. I mean, I had a whole string of shows scheduled for uh, for the summer in uh, in New York. Uh, and, you know, obviously we had to cancel them. But, we're, you know, talking with with, with John Butera and, and the other guys that we're, that we're putting together with, you know, 
we may not even try and reapproach it until at least next summer. It's just not yeah. not worth even trying. Even if even if everything, if they announce tomorrow, we have the cure for coronavirus, everybody's getting the shot within the next two weeks and everything's going to be perfect. It, I still think people are going to have it in their heads. It's going to be agree. a slow progression for people getting back into clubs. And I think where comedians can really capitalize on things is properly using social media. And when we do get into clubs, properly marketing ourselves and not just rely on the promoter to do it. We have to market ourselves. Kyle can, can attest to that. When, you know, out in L.A., if you're not promoting yourself on a show, you know, the club's not doing much to promote you. It's your job to get the audience because that's what they're paying for. They're paying for your audience. See, that's where I think comedy's right. changed over the years, too, because it used to just be you had to be funny. You had to win over the club promoter and or the manager and or the club owner, and if they liked you, they put you on, and people went there because they knew that place always had the best comics. You want to know who fucked that up for everybody? That son of a bitch, Dane Cook. <laughs> I shit on Dane Cook all the time, and yeah, I have no reason I, to do you so. You don't think it happened before then? You no, it's it really... Where, where it happened with, uh, with Dane Cook was he was the first one to truly embrace social media and attract an audience right. outside, o- from off stage. And clubs have seen that. And, I mean, there are still some places that will still will attract an audience. I mean, you know, go, you know the, the places we go, governors, you know, especially the weekend, the primetime spots, you're going to get people in just because it's a comedy club and the doors are unlocked. People are going to come in. But you're not going to pack out a house uh, just for, for no, just because it's Saturday night, you, you still need, you know, the comedians need to, you know, promote themselves as well. And the biggest it's social media is really what it is. Not really Dan cook. I shit on the guy a lot. I hear he's a nice guy. Uh, but I just use him as, exa- as an example. I met him once. Okay. But I use him as the example because he's the one that, that really brought social media to the forefront of attracting the audience, my space. Yeah. yeah. But I, I saw guys le- like less than six months ago who couldn't be bothered to drop a Facebook status update saying I'm at this place this weekend. Well, who do you think you are that you, you don't even, can't even mention your own gig. Oh yeah. The, 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 show up. The doors are open. I see that, 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 that Clark, I mean, I, I've, you know, put shows together here and that's, you know, th- there's very little promotion being done from the comedians. And I'm a big, big believer in you got to take your own destiny into your own hands don't wait for somebody else to promote you do it yourself and those are the people that sit back and bitch like oh nobody came out to the show well what did you do to get people to come to your show nothing yeah absolutely i mean you know in in la in new york if you know dennis when we when we go to do shows in at broadway i'm I'm out there fucking barking on the street i try barking anywhere i can because i fucking love it i I have a good time (laughs) You know, Kyle, do they make you, do, do you bark out in L.A.? They, they don't make you bark more, more so a sense. Uh, you can get into any comedy club in L.A., uh, comedy store, uh, um, flappers, any of the clubs, if you bring an audience. I mean, essentially, um, you bring an audience or you befriend one of the big comics and they pull you on. Now, those are the two ways. And, um, you know, flappers, you got to already have people purchase tickets. So any time I did a show up there, I already had to have the tickets purchased it before I was even put on the show. Um, they had this, I think sometimes they'll have you have it a few days. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, you out here, that's just essential. It, it's not about, I mean, you can be good or bad, um, you know, out here, essentially it's just about what are you bringing in the comedy club? So I can walk up to the comedy store if it was open and, and tell somebody, hey, I, I can bring uh, 15 people here tomorrow night. Can I get some time on stage? And you get it. But if you can't do that, you know, it, it's, it's any of the comedy clubs here. I've, I've experienced it, uh, the, the improv, the this, the that, the that. They, a lot of them want you already have somebody um, coming to, the, to their business establishment. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't get- bark because I have to. Then it's not like you have to go out and bark for an hour to get on stage. I bark because I want to. It's probably because right. I'm fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, yeah you but have to. I, I understand comedy clubs are a business, but at the same time, that's what's killing comedy. Because if you get someone who's got a lot of friends and they're not funny at all, when you get the other people in that show, they're going to go, wow, this sucks. I don't want to be here. And they're going to leave. Or you're going to get a hard time getting your friends in. they got to sit through that. But to be honest with you, you know, you know where you can use that to your own advantage. I see a lot of comics come in, do a show. And as soon as they're done with their set, they're gone. 
They're yeah. out the fucking door. On yep. square we, manners, you should always yeah. wait until at least another comic or two after you performs, and then you gracious, graciously leave in between, like you know, in a non-destructive way to the audience. People need to learn comedy matters manners. See, I, See the way I see it, that's fine. That's fine at an open mic. But if you're on a booked show, you oh, stay till the fucking to end. end. You stay till the end and stand by the exit and say good night to people as you yeah. go because those people may have gone to see their friend who sucks ass. Yes, but they saw you. They liked you, and now that you're talking to them at the end, you know, even though we're essentially nobodies, they saw us on stage. We're somebody to them for at least that night. So make an impression on them. Have a business card with your social media links and hand them out. And, and you know, it's, you, that's how you cultivate an audience. And uh, so many people just fucking lose that. And yeah, um, I, I got to work. Wanna... Hey, Clark, what'd you say? And why wouldn't you want to stick around? Who are you that you think you know everything that, oh, I, I did my time. I already know what this guy's going to do. I can't pick up anything from him. Let me go on to my next deal. I mean, it, it, you're not, you're not at the you're not at the Beacon Theater in New York. You can't pull that. You don't have to disappear because there's 500 people, you know, going to be tackling you for a fucking autograph. Right. right. Exactly. What yeah. What were you saying, Dennis? No, I so said the only time I leave early is if I got to go to work. Then, yeah. You know, right. But right. at the same time, to me, if you're on a real show and not just like an open mic thing, the headliner most likely is pretty talented and has been doing it for quite some time. And just watching them, you could learn a lot. Whether yep. it's their delivery, the timing, how they interact. Why would you want to learn that? Why exactly. Would, Some people know everything. Be? Yeah. Yeah, there's people who've been doing it for a year that know more than everybody. But, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, to me, I want to learn. And even if it's one of the new kind, if I did a show with all, all of you, I would want to watch you. Yeah. You know, if you're right before me, honestly, I'm probably not watching you because I'm running my set through my head trying to remember stuff but if you're right after me i'm watching the show yeah and i'm Clark, watching what you're yeah. it, it's these guys who think they're artists who oh you know I, I i'm putting my art out there and that's all i'm interested in fuck you you're an entertainer and you're there to sell tickets to a club that wants to sell people two drinks yes you know you're not an artist you're not the next andy coffin until you're the next andy coffin true so. I love Andy Kaufman. I miss him. Yeah, I got to stop. Next time I'm in Cleveland, I got to stop at his donut shop. Oh, he's not dead. He's fucking, he's in Cleveland. Oh, <laughs> I think, I honestly, I, I honestly think that Andy Kaufman faked his own death. If anybody did, it's him. Yeah. There was a lot of buzz with that right before Man in the Moon came out because they thought he was going to show up at the premiere. Okay. And obviously he didn't, but. Yeah, I, th I, I think. That he's alive. Exactly. By not exactly. showing up, it proves that he's still out there and he could have shown up. <laughs> True. See, see, I think Andy Kaufman <laughs> faked his death better than Elvis did. Oh, totally. <laughs> um, it's all one big long bit he's doing. He's committed to it. Right Wait, <laughs> on his deathbed, somebody's going to take a fucking. They're going to do his, uh, uh, you know, a Facebook live from his deathbed, and he's going to be like, <laughs> "I was here the whole time." Yeah. <laughs> fucking terrible uh, but but that's where I, I see comedy going as far as from the performance level is is it's going to rely more heavily on not so much like zoom stand up but but you know just reaching the audience and trying to pull them in i think that the little room is going to be empty for a long time a lot of the small clubs are going to be empty for a long time or at least spaced out that the little room for anybody who's never been to the little room at governors, which is a, a popular uh, room and a big comedy club for up and comers. It is 60 people crammed into a real small area. They sort of sit on each other's laps. Literally. I mean, there's, there's a, a row against the wall, a double row down the middle, another double row, and then a couple tables off to the side and like two or three tables in the back. And that's it. And it's 60 people on top of each other, you know, spacing out i mean even if you get 30 people in that room i'd be surprised at least for the next you know maybe year yeah and i think what you'll see as a result of that like uh preacher lawson would do seven sold out shows at side splitters oh from thursday to sunday he'll probably now start doing 12 shows between wednesday 
and late Sunday, you know, to get the same numbers, but it's spread out further in smaller rooms. Correct. And even, you know, from the club's perspective, you know, it costs them X amount of money to put on a show. So yeah. doing that, you're still, you know, even if you get the same total number of asses in the seats, just by virtue of the fact that the club has to now be open an additional two days, right. they're going to yeah. be making less money. So yeah. whether that happens, maybe not two day, you know, 12 shows, but I could see definitely adding on another day uh, to, well, to, to, uh, to the string of shows. It, it's really not comparable, but I was working not as a comic, but in sports and entertainment when 9-11 happened. And what you saw happen there was shows of all kind went away for a while. But when they came back, big acts were doing small theaters. Like I saw Prince in Lakeland in a room that held 200 people. Jesus. Wow. That had to be badass tickets, though. Yeah, it was bad. It was a great show and tickets were more expensive. But if you're in the last row of a theater that holds 200 people, you don't mind paying a hundred bucks for a ticket because it's still going to be a great seat. Now, I don't know if you'll see similar things happen here because you still got the social distancing, but you know, that that's what happened after nine 11 was people scaled back their shows. So, yeah. And, and, and I think you're going to see that to, to even a larger extent. I mean, the fear um, between September 11th and now is, you know, a, a different kind of fear. I mean, back, you know, then it was, you're afraid of uh, you know an airplane coming crashing into the building or right. you know a car bomb blowing up. Now you know the guy sitting next to you could be the one that infects you. I mean, exactly. For, for you guys who don't know, uh, Dennis actually had coronavirus. Oh wow! Yeah, he looked a lot better beforehand. That that's what coronavirus <laughs> does to your face. I don't know. I don't know where you are in relation to everybody else. I'm in the middle right now. Kyle's over there. Dennis is over there. And. Clark and and but I'm so I'm pointing over there because that's where he is. But yeah, uh, Dennis recovered from COVID nineteen. Oh, congratulations! Yeah. Like, Dennis sucks you. Yeah, I used to look just like Chris Helmsworth, and this happened. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you're, Rod, you're, see, you're you're 100 recovered now, right? Yes, yes. But okay. that's the other question too, is because comedy clubs are about the money. If they have to limit the capacity to 25 percent or 50 percent. What are they charging for tickets then? Uh, yeah. That's that, or, uh, you know, what, what are they paying for tickets? You know, charging it's for hard tickets. to get people in at a 10 or 20 dollar show. If it's a 40 or 50 dollar show, they're not coming. Yeah. Not unless there's a real, real name headliner on that and, show. And, and, and the clubs, you know, obviously the virtue, you know, the, the, you know, the, the cost and, and process of doing business is they're going to have to figure that, that part out for themselves. Um, right. as of right honestly, now, I'm not looking to produce any shows until next year at all. Zero, none, none. none. Uh, I'll see how it goes, but I'm wondering if I'm even going to get back into stand up in and of itself because I started doing improv. I started acting. I'm actually really enjoying them. I miss that stuff. I don't really miss the stand up as much as I thought I would. Okay. And then I'm just questioning all these things that we're talking about now. What's it going to be? How many people do I have to bring? What are they going to have to pay? Yep. I, I, are they gonna, I, is it going to be funny? You know, are people going to be so scared? If somebody coughs, is like, oh my god, I got to leave. You know, it, and then again, the, the load of coronavirus jokes that are going to be out there from everybody else. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Like, and 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 I think it's just it's going to have to be play it as it comes. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, looking at what I so see, you're raising your hand like a good little student. <laughs> yes, I didn't want to interrupt, but let me jump in. Oh my god, Dennis, I feel you. It's always good to explore your. <laughs> that come with comedy, but I miss stand up on the stage so much. I miss it so much, but I'm trying to stay positive and think of the future. What Roger said about this baby boom, this kind of evolution of comedy that we have to go through as we're rolling with the punches of this pandemic right now. I like to think that what's getting us through this quarantine is good TV for me anyway. Good fun yeah. TV and pot, honestly. Tiger <laughs> King! <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're comics and we're writers. So I don't know about you guys. I'm sure you guys are writing like I am. So keep writing. And then when these projects start coming out and when the quarantine is over, we're going to boom of all this fabulous new content that we created during this time that we're kind of fucked. <laughs> and, well, and Okay, Clark. To counter that a little bit, I'm not writing any jokes right now. My my What I feel is my strongest material comes from interacting with people and that's not happening. So I'm not getting inspired by a lot. I'm writing other stuff, but it's not jokes for stand up. 
And I'm kind of where Dennis is. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe I don't even go back to it. See, I'll, I'll go back to it just because I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, diversifying. Uh, you know, aside from my day job, I do the voice acting and the, and the voice work. So, you know, I, I have that cooking. But stand up to me is, is more of a hobby and a release. It's obvious a hobby if you've if ever seen me. Um, but, <laughs> oh, you know, I, th I think as things come back, you'll, you, you both will probably come back just because, you know, it's like the mob. Every time you try to come back, get out, they yeah, bring you right. in. But, but I, I definitely see it being a slow progression, getting back into performing to the, the number of shows and, and trying to pack crowds. That's going to take a long fucking time. It really is. See, Roy, yeah. I want you. It was a hobby for me as well. I never had illusions that I was going to be this great headlining comic touring the world. That's not what I was trying to do. I was just doing it to have fun. And if it's not going to be fun, then I'm, I don't want any part of it. You know what I'm saying? Yep. That, that's what it should be. I mean, you do something you love and you never work a day in your life. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and that's, what it, uh, that's what it comes down to. Uh, what, what, what do you see, foresee uh, on the West Coast, Kyle, uh, as far as uh, getting back into the groove of performing? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with everybody, you know, as, as far as, you know, especially out here because it's, it's highly congested out here and, and especially out in uh, California, everybody's very health conscious out here. Even before this happened, this is very, you know. Yeah, I know the skinny area. fucks out there. Yeah, it's very. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I think more with my move um, is kind of what I um, saw when I first got here um, was um, you got to build your own audience. Um, and then you you have to find like new channels to deal with your audience through, which whether that be YouTube, TikTok. To, and I'm just keep them interested. About, yeah. Sustaining a living, because it will be a minute before a lot of these comedy places open back up out here. Um, so I'm just, you know, I, I, and I know it's kind of hard because you're on a talking to a camera, you're not really getting any interaction, but um, that's the, that's where I see it going. I saw that happening before the pandemic. Um, a lot of um, comedians, you know, that we were seeing were able to go on um, line or some media was Instagram or YouTube and build their audience that way. Um, but I, I think that, that may be the only option for a minute out here because essentially that was how it was in a lot of the big club tier comedy store and the improv where, um, you know, you had comics that were, you know, doing what you think is supposed to be done, stand outside in line, try to get on the mic. If I'm good enough, someone likes me. Um, it, but then you have the people that had a following on Instagram or YouTube that were getting on the stage, that were getting on all the shows. Cause so, they're putting asses in seats. Yeah, they, they yeah. can bring, they can up to them and say, hey, I can bring, you know, you tell a club on, hey, I can bring 50 people in here. They'll throw you on. I, it, it happens all the time here. So I think like maybe social media, like a YouTube channel where maybe you're doing your um, your own thing um, and building your own audience because. Well, um, the, the downside to that right now is, is because there are so many comedians and actors out of work. YouTube, TikTok, all of those, you know, platforms are so saturated with people. Just trying to navigate and find somebody to find something you like it, it is really tough. Just because there's so fucking many of them out there right now. Well, and yeah, Roger, well, that's what. Uh, mm -hmm. Clark, I was just gonna say a lot of that content mm -hmm. that you're seeing out there is is the uh, throw it against the wall and see what sticks too. There's no consistency to it. It's just like you know, everybody's so desperate to hit that they're like, oh, this is a germ of an idea. I'll make a sketch out of it and I'll throw it on YouTube or TikTok and, and yeah, hope and for hope, the best. And the other thing is hope for the best, but there's yeah. so many people that everybody gets lost in algorithms. Nice right. pussy, Jessica. Thank <laughs> what? you. You, you <laughs> can't see Jessica. My white Jessica, pussy. It just got really shave. technical. I, I would have thought you had one of those shaved pussies that, uh -huh. uh, that Donnie's got. Nah, during the quarantine, <laughs> she got pretty hairy. I'm rocking that vintage right now. Nice. <laughs> but... But that's the other problem is is algorithms. Like I see a lot of the stuff that Tampa News Force does. You know, yeah. a lot of what, what what you guys do is fucking hilarious. But then you look at the view count and it's so low yeah. that it's just it's hard to get out. And you know, you and I were talking about it about Vic DiBattetto with he got famous yeah. over one over hitting on one fucking video, and right. actually now two because of the one he made uh, where he was yeah. really wasn't being funny. He was just fucking flipping out worldwide. <laughs> 
He's worldwide and, on that. Ozzy Man Reviews was all over that. Yeah. And Vic's the first one to tell you, like, I didn't set out with a strategy or a plan, you know? Nope. He, he was just doing hit. the best he could. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's that one stupid <laughs> video. But the key thing is, is getting that video seen and getting, you know, getting people to getting it out there. You could put well, it on YouTube, but that doesn't mean it's going to go anywhere, no matter how funny it is or how unique it is. Sure. Well, the classic example there is South Park became a hit because they made one video and it was Jesus versus Santa fighting over Christmas. It was a and video George, Christmas card. Yeah. And George Clooney saw it of all people <clears throat> and shared it with people. But there, yeah. again, no, no strategy there. Nobody sat down and said, this is our six month marketing plan. No, and even then, if it if you know how they they filmed that very first one, they literally used a camera, construction paper, and yeah. mouth shapes making consonant sounds, <laughs> and shot it yep. frame by frame with a camera and construction paper. And you to watch it, and you can tell. Laugh. Yeah. yeah, to make their their buddies laugh. Yeah, and I it's, it's had George Clooney do one of the voices on the show, but it was the voice of like a cat. I'm it was a gay you. dog. <laughs> they well, yeah. they they did the same. South Park did the same thing that Police Squad did. They would have a big name do a voice, and it was always something silly like, you know, a cat or a, yeah. just a well, grunt, a noise. Right. Rog, I saw the interview with them on that, and George Clooney asked to be on South Park. And they said their initial reaction was like, of course, yeah. But then right. they thought about it, like, wait, we're anti-establishment. We can't have a major actor on like that. So, so they asked, and they said, would you be a gay dog? And he goes, sure. Thank you. <laughs> so that's what he was. He was a gay, dog, right, a gay so dog. He went with the joke, dog, and they didn't it? sell out. Yeah, but I gained a lot of respect for George Clooney after that. Oh, but yeah. if George never sees that first video, who knows? We may never even hear of South Park. You know, yeah. probably not. No, and it would have been something else, and that—that's what it is. Yeah. If it's not you, it's somebody else. Yeah, and you know, yeah. we need—we need to come up with what what's going to be our thing, and you know, see. Well, that's the thing out. is, the secret is, it just has to happen. If you try yeah. too hard, the secret it is work. there is no secret. Just, yeah, you just do, do it. it. The, the secret is happens. just do it. And hope yeah, I don't know how, I, like Rod, you, you, I know when, when I had the podcast, I tried everything to promote the hell out of it. And every time I thought I figured it out, the next week my views were in the toilet. I'm like, but what happened? Dude, like, I've, been do, I've been doing my show. I've been doing the FUBAR show now. We're coming on four years. I've been doing it. And I have some, some episodes have a thousand views, you know. And, you know, whatever, I, you know, I can only yeah. see the stats on, on, I only pay attention to the stats on YouTube for some stupid reason. So I don't know how many other, from other sources it's got, but, you know, normally on a live feed, I get like 10 people max. Unless, unless I'm interviewing hookers or strippers and then people come out. It's, it's so, weird. That's what it was. I started getting up near 1,200, 1,500 views regularly thinking I got it. And then all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm at 300 again. But I was told. Well, that's only because you had me on the show that time. Yeah. No, but I was told by people it's Facebook because they oh, have yeah. an algorithm. And because I wasn't paying to be on Facebook, once you get too big, they shut you down. Once you get too big and once it, you pay. Then it would have been, yeah. Once you pay. Called, uh, that, phenomenon yeah, is called, that phenomenon is called shadow banning. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm, sha I'm shadow banned on Instagram and Twitter and yeah, probably now they Facebook. They don't come out. <laughs> also not going out like it was so yeah like like you know a couple of the videos that you guys made like the the asshole one yeah where you know word on the street is you're an asshole and this asshole written on the street in chalk it's fucking so stupidly <laughs> silly so stupid. it's yeah. brilliant and i laughed my fucking ass off the other yeah. one that was great was the bobby katie one with the old-fashioned oh yeah that one and was fucking great uh, another example is, uh, th I think the guys that shot the, uh, that made a, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, the legend is they spent $200 shooting the pilot on these VHS tapes and they dispute whether they even spent $200 on it. Yeah. Wow. You know? And now they've got a sitcom that's been on what, 15 years or something. Yeah. Kevin Smith, when he did clerks, the, yeah. I, I forget how it was like $60,000 is what he spent to film clerks. And he half of that. Half of that, half of the cost of production of the movie Clerks was getting the rights to, I forget what song it was, getting the rights to one song was half the budget of the film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at look at um, The Simpsons. Tracy yeah. Ullman Show. A little show. bit on the Tracy Ullman Show that they never thought was going to do anything. And what is it, the longest running show ever now? 
Yeah. Yeah. And, so the lesson, and, the lesson there on all those things is just do your best to be funny. Keep throwing and, shit up against the wall and keep promoting it. Yeah. Uh, it's positive vibes. You never and, know. Yeah. Yes. Hey, now there's no sense in wasting. Say, say that one yeah. more time, Clark. Because it's you, pointless you, you to waste off. time on a marketing plan and, and oh, and oh stuff. yeah. So especially it's now with that. What you need to invest in is invest yeah. in people that are willing to share your shit. Yeah. Because that's the best, you know, if, if you, if you got, you know, 20 P 20 of your friends to yeah. share some, even if you threw them five bucks each, you spent a hundred bucks, you're probably getting more action than if you spent a hundred bucks on a, on a Facebook ad. Really? Yeah. Right. No, it, it, it's insane. And I, I've paid for, for Facebook ads in the past, and they were absolutely fucking worthless. <laughs> absolutely worthless. Yeah. But like you said, once you pay, you're stuck. Because if you yep. don't pay again, then you, nobody sees your stuff. Yep. And here's something you can spread to all your friends. Here's the Facebook emo, you know, emotions, the, 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 the heart, the laughing face, the, you know, all Facebook assigns a value to those. So as it calculates the algorithm, a like is worth less than the laughing face. Right. The laughing face is worth less than the the heart. And the the angry is, you know, the the, the I think that you know it's as it goes down, there there's a value to each of them. So you need to encourage your friends. One one thing that irritates the shit out of me, and I'm not gonna say the comedian's name, but there was a comedian here in Tampa that from the stage called me out for for heart emoting all her pictures. I guess Clark's uh thing took a shit but so she called me out calling like saying i was creepy because i fucking heart react all, all of her shit and so from that day i unfriend i didn't unfriend her. i just unfollowed her and don't interact with her zero at all anymore because i'm not i'm not heart reacting your shit because i think you're cute because i want to bang you or any other it's because i try to push my friend i try to you know increase that algorithm because i know that it exists wait you're not doing that to bang me rog <laughs> there's an exception we had to something. every rule there is always an exception dennis <laughs> fucking do you prison style motherfucker that's no rules and no, uh, no lube and no consent is prison style but yeah, uh, but, i heard that too that the emojis had values i, I didn't know that someone told me that abs like, yeah, abs you gotta get people to stop liking your stuff and doing the other emojis he, here's another thing on on instagram Seven is the, the lucky number of hashtags. Oh, it actually mm. works for Instagram and Twitter. Seven is the lucky number for hashtags. And you mm. want to use hashtags that have that have uh, have been used over 50,000 times. So mm. Instagram does it very easily. When you put up a, uh, uh, try to put up a hashtag, it'll tell you, unless it's a recent one you've used, it'll tell you how many times it's been been used. Mm. And you want to go for mm. ones that have, that have more action. If you, you I, I didn't know that at all. Got, because that's the shit people are searching for and people are using. So yeah. those are the little tips and tricks that can help promote stuff. Like I said, I click the heart emo, you know, the heart react, not really because I love it. It could fucking suck. But if you're a friend of mine, I'm going to try and push shit as far as I can. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you, you, yours is an exception too, Jessica. Because <laughs> I love you. <laughs> you too, Kyle. <laughs> 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 everybody uses social media differently but as a comic you have to you know at least use it to promote yourself get your shows out there get your content out there and really facebook charging for ads i think is total bullshit and i know oh, yeah. that facebook also owns instagram so just because i like instagram better it doesn't matter it's the same shit but when you think about realistically who's winning here so you spend money on facebook and then you have this ad they're on facebook. winning uh, yeah, they are. And also, going towards the future, the younger generations don't give a fuck about Facebook. A lot of people my age and, and young are on Facebook. It's not going to be around forever, you know? And it doesn't matter if it goes into, now Instagram's a shit, now TikTok is a shit. Remember Vine? That shit, all your shit could be gone in a second. So Rip. back it up. Put it on your hard drive, Mary. It's, Rip it's Vine. Not well, that, was, it, that was the inspiration for TikTok. Yeah, well, fucking TikTok can't fucking the, 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 TikTok's not even good enough to smell Vine shit. All right, Vine <laughs> was the fuck. it, it's the it's the hot thing right now though. 
and, and here's the thing. Like I, I've been toying with the idea of, of getting on there and starting to put out some stuff. I'm like, all I'm going to do is just curse into the fucking camera. <laughs> like that's all I'm going to do. I was thinking about setting up a TikTok and just every day, look at the camera deadpan and just go motherfucker. And that's it. That's my whole father. That's going to be my fucking thing. Work. You should try that. That might. I'll fucking give it a shot. Somebody. Now that I said it on here, somebody's gonna probably fucking do it. But <laughs> well, whatever. So I don't TikTok tonight. Send it to me. I'm there you go. I'm just, I'm just gonna deadpan. Like look, motherfucker. It's your daily motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Raj's angry face on TikTok in between a million fifteen-year-olds dancing. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny is my my son I, my my son's fifteen and he's in the marching band and the marching band kids figured out that I had Instagram and. Like I post occasionally offensive stuff, and I had one of these fucking kids from another, like a school my son didn't even go to. Like I, I think it was like the sixty nine days till Christmas or something like that, because sixty nine is the greatest number ever. They, they're like, okay, boomer. I was so fucking oh. offended at that. Like, I'm fucking. Oh. That's the a new insult. Fucking forty one, bitch. Fucking Gen X. We don't dab. We say suck it. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, seriously, they, they said "Okay, Boomer" to my fucking the goddamn man. <laughs> you know like, what? If younger generations aren't canceling boomers, quarantine <laughs> fucking the pandemic, unfortunately, will. That's so messed up. I can't believe they did that shit to you. <laughs> Mind your own business. You're gonna do what the hell you want to do. Doesn't matter. But like, like, yeah. here's the thing, like. You could say almost anything to me. Like you cannot, it's impossible to offend me unless you call me a boomer. Like that's where I draw the, that's where the line is. Yeah, boomers got what, 20 years on you? At least, man. No. Shit, my wife, my wife is fucking nine years older than me. She's not a boomer. You're generation X, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Clark, are you a boomer? Clark Clark dropped off. Oh no. I think. Yeah, I think uh, Nicole says, okay, boomer, in the fucking comments. I love you, Nicole. Um, no, I think Clark got this because he froze and then went away. Yeah, he lost the connection. Us, which sucks. I love I love Clark. It's a shame. He seemed like he had a lot of good points, but he kept freezing. Yeah. No, that's why I wanted Clark on here, because he's a fucking smart guy. Yeah. But uh, but but that's the thing, and 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 that you know, I, I think that's the future of, of comedy is is – you know, the slow progression and getting back onto stages and then the pushing the social media stuff, you know, the, the, the TikToks, uh, you know, they should bring Vine back just because tick. I don't even like the way TikTok sounds just TikTok. <laughs> Vine was like Vine. That's a little intrigue. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say, Kyle? Uh, I mean, Hey, you just got to, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot of testing, you know, it's just like, for what I say is like, you know, I maybe see the only option I do know, like with social media, what, what I've kind of experienced is that it is like you're you're throwing things on the wall. I think, you know, the people that um, the part that they don't show about the people who do get successful, there are those, you know, what, what I call those lottery tickets when someone does one video and it sets their career. Um, the big thing is like consistency. It's just like, you know, at, at this time, you know, everything's shut down. So it's like, you know, if, if, you know, whatever medium you're more comfortable with, I just know the big thing is like consistency. You know, you, you put out video a day, you know, for two or three years, um, you either gonna, something's going to happen for you or you're going to learn what doesn't work. Um, and I think it's, it's like an ongoing battle, like, you know, cause I'm having to do stuff. Like I just want to talk. But, you know, I'm having to try to educate myself on how to edit video, um, you know, what, you know, what is effective for me to try to build a successful channel or a successful, you know, this, because like I said, I just see like, that's the only, you know, at this point, the only option, because I know out here, you know, they're very health conscious, it's very congested out here. And it may be, it could be almost over a year, a year and a half for any of these places open up. You know, the places yeah. are really scared because, because of, you know, you know, it, it is a health concern. But what the problem is going to be after they, you know, lift these, you know, these locks on these businesses is that a lot of businesses are going to be scared of getting sued because yeah, what if it's someone a liability goes into the comedy store and now they've got they have COVID because they were at the comedy store. You that know, happened to Disney. <clears throat> that that happened to Disney last year with uh, what was it? Malaria or some shit. I forget. One of the M diseases, just look it up, it's M. Uh -huh. But they, there was an outbreak of, of a, a, a disease 
that they were able to trace back and it, it was the, all the, the common thread was Disneyland. That, that's an interesting question too. How many of these comedy clubs are just not going to reopen at all? A lot well, of a lot restaurants of the, are going down. A lot of the smaller ones are probably going to go out. I mean, I don't know what, what, I mean, you know, Dennis, you, you, you haven't been down here. All right. On Long Island, you have McGuire's and Bohemia. You got governors and you got the uh, brokerage. All right. Basically three official comedy clubs for the 4 million people that live in Nassau, Suffolk counties. Here in Tampa, which is a city of like, I think, uh, you know, the Tampa Bay area, I think there's like a million, million and a half people. We got like six comedy clubs. So how the fuck they're going to survive? Don't New York City. Theater 297, and I think there's a Giggles out east in Long Island. Uh, Still? I don't know. Yeah, Maybe where, where, it's not far, but I know... Where, Two nine seven in Farmingdale is is a comedy club. I promise. But is it is it is it strictly a comedy club or is it a club that does a comedy night? Because I've never heard of that place. There's a lot of bars and stuff that do yeah. comedy nights, but they're not clubs. They're not. Yeah, I'm talking about a, like legit official comedy club. That's all they do. That's that's their shit. Yeah. No, you're right. Theater two nine seven does other things. I've just done a lot of really good shows there. A shout out. Don't want to forget them completely. <laughs> But you're right, brokerage. Yeah, I've, done, I've done a lot of good shows at Barton's Place in Mount Sinai. It doesn't make it a comedy club. <laughs> Ma mainly because that's the only club I go to, or well, you know, bar. That's the only place I go to to do shows where I actually drink. <laughs> Next, I'm gonna be like, "Does my mom's basement count? <laughs> <laughs> does my does my Zoom video count?" Where I'm just, I mean, doing doing comedy on a Zoom video is like doing an open mic in Tampa. There's nobody there. <laughs> Apple's is just doing Zoom um, auditions right now. They've been they do them um, every Tuesday now. Did you Rapper's see? Did you see the message club. I sent to you, Kyle, about doing getting into voice work? Yeah, yeah. Oh, people have been too. telling me out here. I, I've had a few a few things. I've had people stop stop me out up in Hollywood and, and just like you got a real commanding voice. Go um, on so, fucking yeah. Amazon. Buy yourself a Blue Yeti microphone. It's like a hundred hundred twenty bucks. To you, it comes a whole, the whole thing's all fucking together. It's a great uh -huh. package for 120 bucks and get uh -huh. yourself do, doing auditions for voice work. You don't waste that fucking buttery fucking voice, man. All yeah, right, I'm gonna... for real. He's, uh, I do voiceover work too. And um, just to get you by in between, you could definitely do it. I'm writing down that microphone. Thank you, Raj. <laughs> yeah, I'm, writing, I'm putting it in my phone now. I'm standing up because yeah, the stool it. I have here, my butt went numb. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. Kyle's got that almost like that Morgan Freeman type comforting voice. I could definitely see you doing some stuff. He does. Yeah, Don't waste people, it. Don't let that go to waste. Uh, yeah, they, that was the first thing I, I, when I was uh, at the comedy store that people was like, man, you got a real commanding voice. Like, I'm going to stop it. Jessica just farted. <laughs> it was a big one. Are you guys into that? My fans only account really loves my farts. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, and, yeah, and that's yeah. the thing is 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 diversifying what you're doing. Acting auditions is great. I mean, down here in town, there are no auditions. You know, Dennis, you're getting yeah. into it. I don't know if you're getting any parts. I but did. That's what sucks. I just got a part in a movie, and the whole world shut down. Well, my, my, oh. Congrats. My stepdaughter, my Thanks. stepdaughter and her boyfriend are both in the film industry. They're both, uh, you know, you, uh, she's a, a production coordinator, I think, and and he's a, an audio guy. So they're both completely out of work. Like they, they live in a store, they live in Astoria, and they they like fucking don't leave their apartment. They they stay in their apartment twenty four seven. Astoria is too damn expensive not to have work. God damn, I'm so yeah. Well, sorry these fuckers, are, these fuckers are looking at a you know looking at buying a house. I'm like, oh, what's your budget? Oh, three million. Fuck you. Wow. Must I be nice. You. I'm a good real estate agent. Yeah. Well, they're looking to buy. They want to keep their apartment in the city. They want to buy a house up upstate. <clears throat> Basically, come down, work, and go up there for the weekend and holidays and furloughs. Get out of the city. <clears throat> I told them, go to Pennsylvania. It's at least not in New York. See, the thing I find that, that I like more about acting, too, it's all on me. I just have to be good. I don't need to bring 10, 15 friends three times a week. I don't have to sit home and write new stuff constantly and try to be cutting edge. I just got to go out there and perform and just be the best I could be. I'm surprised they're just doing a remake of Frankenstein, though. 
<laughs> hey, that's I love you. Keep remaking the old. <laughs> hey, whatever. If you if you get the role, it doesn't fucking matter what it is. Just do the, do the, do the fucking. I'll give thing. a shout out to the Actors Workshop and Chris Cardona. But he asked me, he goes, "Would you have a problem being typecast?" I said, "Well, I have two questions: Am I going to get roles? Am I going to get paid?" Because if the answer is yes to both of those, I don't care. Typecast me, put me in the same role. Work for De Niro. He did the same role his whole career and did Man, very there, well. There are so many fucking actors that did. I mean, you know, I'm not calling you ugly, Dennis, but you have a very unique look. I mean, you're a big dude. You know, yeah. you got a very, very, very re- unique look. So getting typecast, there are a lot of actors that got typecast, you know, and that's fine. Again, yeah. you're getting the role, you're getting fucking paid. Just do the fucking thing. Right. Yeah. Right. The, you know, the see, best roles I've gotten on like a commercial or two, whatever, was always plus size girls. I knew if I was applying for some shit, if that shit did not say plus rocket. size, they were not calling me. But plus size shit, oh, I got that shit. Rocket, <laughs> rocket, fuck it. That, do the fucking thing. What's funny Tight is a, lo- a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the voice work I do, a lot of the voice work I do is audiobook narration. <clears throat> and Love first that. of all, first of all, most of these audiobooks, you know, people who write a lot of these books are fucking illiterate. <laughs> Too most of the ones that and they're the low hanging fruit, but I make money on it. It's all like nonfiction, self help type thing. Like I'm working on a book right now that's on mind control and manipulation. And you don't laugh at yourself while reading the garbage. <laughs> that's the fucking problem. Is you know, like I, I, I wish I could like play a cl- an unedited clip of me recording because every two seconds I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? This isn't even fucking English. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but you got to roll with it. And there are some sentences that are just so bad and they don't want you changing too much. So it's like I have to read it and I almost have to like not even say words. I'm just saying sounds that sound like words. And they still pay me. So what the fuck ever. But it's like, you know, I'm, I'm reading it like mind control and manipulation. Blah, blah, blah. Fucking just droning on. And it's, you know, but but they're, they're paying me to do the fucking thing. So I'm going to do the fucking thing. Whatever. Right. But that's yeah. the thing. So do that. So the, the name of the company that makes it is Blue. The microphone is called Yeti. It's fucking actually. Tell my boy to bring that thing in here. It's a fucking great microphone. And it and it's self-contained. It's like 100 percent self-contained. So it's just a USB you plug into the computer and oh, okay. like every you plug headphones into it. You got different settings. Um, and this is not an endorsement. They're not paying my ass to say this. I just happen to like the product. <laughs> I also Sponsor don't. Sponsor Rod. I would also him. like to say that this is the microphone I use for my voiceovers, and it is not the Blue Yeti. I do use the Blue Yeti for different things. Uh, messages. I'm here on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, check check it out. They make it comes in different colors. Mine happens to be the platinum version because that was the actually the cheaper one when I got it. <clears throat> Weird. Bring me the Yeti. He's probably happy I haven't been fucking making him bring me beer all night. <clears throat> <laughs> Mainly because I drank a shitload earlier, so I started the show drunk. I'm sobering up now. But, uh, yeah. Nice. Rock out. Good for you. Raj, I, I never vape. I'm vaping in honor of you because I love how you call it the, the douche juice. <laughs> the douche, no, douche flute. It is the douche, douche flute. flute. Your robot I like penis. To suck, I like to suck robot dick. It's my first time getting a small one. I don't feel anything. Maybe you should have gone for the big one. <laughs> I usually do. The black one. I was just say the black one I heard was bigger. Kyle, I miss you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, good times. Good times. <laughs> good times. Good times. But uh, yeah, so I mean, is, is there anything else you guys wanted to, to talk about? Mention that I that we haven't gotten to. Uh, no, I think we, we've been cover, covering it all. It's just a good thing to see how things are going on a, across the country, really. You know, as far yeah, as and that's what I, that's why I wanted to get you guys all together because you know specifically you're from different. You know, you know, I I'm the common thread between everybody, but I mean, you know, Kyle, you're from Tampa. Jessica, you're originally from New York. You're here in Tampa. Dennis, you're from New York. The pizza joint yeah. still open though, Dennis. Yeah, oh, the, the pizza joint still open. That's, that's all I care about. <laughs> I, I, the, 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 of all the shows that got canceled for, for the summer, there's one. The one I'm saddest about was I was supposed to do a, a big show in the parking lot in a tent with John Butera, 
at Aww. Cafe Spiga. And as he's telling me about it, the, the, the word he said was Zeppeli. Uh, and I just stopped him right there. I'm like, you say no more. I'm fucking in. I don't care about it. I don't care what it's paying. I don't care about anything else. You said Zeppeli truck and I'm in. That's it. That's all I need. Because I haven't had Zeppeli. Zeppelis. I haven't had a Zeppeli in at least okay. 10 years. Like, Kyle, you know what a Zeppeli is? He's like, no, no, no. Kyle. no. All right, it's it's like an Italian yeah, donut. It's like a little ball of fried dough <laughs> with powdered sugar on it. Uh -huh. You get them at street fairs and stuff. This mm, like so oh, wow. they got to be done right though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Got to get it from the right place. Yeah. Otherwise, if you, if somebody tries to separately from the wrong place, they're gonna think they're horrible. True. The closest thing I can get down bag. here are Chinese donuts. A bag of powdered sugar. It's like you're chasing diabetes. It's like you're daring diabetes. To I get already got the fucking beetus, <laughs> and those things are worth losing a foot for. All right. <laughs> Don't lose your foot over fucking donuts. <laughs> when, when we were kids, we would, we would eat the fucking bag of Zeppelis and then like fucking snort the powdered sugar like it was Coke. Oh, man. <laughs> now you know why I got fucking diabetes. We used to buy Fun Dip. Oh, God. Fun Dip and uh, Pixie Sticks. Yeah. Well, Fun Dip was just different colored powdered sugar that you took a solid sugar stick and just licked it and dipped it in there and ate it. You know what I do now? Like my kids will still get... My kids will still get it. Like my wife will buy a box of them for uh, for, for like Valentine's Day. Issue. I throw the sh the powdered sugar away. I just eat the sticks. The stick <laughs> was the best part. It was. Like the <laughs> stick in Fun Dip is like the bottom of a Marino's Italian ice. Yes. That's the best fucking part. Mm. Oh, Jesse, yeah. do, you, do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit before my time. But yeah, when I was a little girl, I definitely had some fun dip and I definitely had some before some your time. Meat. Shit, lady, they still make all that shit. You just can't get the Marino's Italian ices here in Florida. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's it, you, I can get almost anything else. W the one thing I found and all these had like last year, the friendlies watermelon roll. Oh, yes. I remember that. I remember so that. Good. That shit was crack. <laughs> Whenever I go up to New York, I get one. And like over the course of the week I'm there, I'll like fucking eat the whole thing over the course of a week. It's fucking terrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just afraid the friendlies is going to be gone soon. Yeah, Isn't there's it? one down here. There is one here. I thought I know it was a lot already of closed. closed. No, they, they closed a, a bunch in New York, but I know like Miller Place is still a well, That's where I'm, I'm, I'm from. Uh, there's still a few outside. around, but it's just. Yeah, you know a lot of they were, they were having trouble to begin with. I just hope this don't put the rest of them out. There's mm -hmm. one in Florida, in Orlando, on the corner of I Drive and John Young. Hmm. Yes. So next time you're in Orlando, hit up Friendlies, get yourself a fribble. <laughs> They're so good. My son's useless. Let's see what my daughter will bring. Him. <laughs> he is. He's probably he. I, I remember I, fribbles. I, fribbles are so good. It's, it's, it's they so are. Good. Kyle has no it's fucking idea what we're talking about. Like he's completely yeah. lost right now. <laughs> there, there's a there's a restaurant in, in the Northeast uh, uh -huh. called Friendlies, and it's it's ice cream and like you know burgers and chicken sandwiches and shit like that. Oh, okay. uh, but the ice cream is really what made this place. And their their milkshake is called a fribble. It's like the Friendlies fribbles. Mm -hmm. It's good. And you Friendly's would go there in elementary school, like you and the whole gang after chorus, oh, cool. after like a recital. Yep. That was yep. the shit. You went to Friendly's. Like as an adult, yeah. don't eat Friendly's food. That's garbage and they don't care yeah. about you. Yeah. Just have the ice cream. As Hang a kid, on. let me, let me like, bring it down. Let me, put, let me put it in language that, that I know Kyle will understand. It's the only place you can legally get a happy ending at the end. <laughs> <laughs> when you get when you get the food, you can get a small Sundae. For and like sometimes it's free. Yeah, sometimes the happy ending is free, and nothing beats a free happy ending. <laughs> and it doesn't give you that shameful look when you're done. <laughs> I don't care. I, I, I love that shameful look. I don't give a fuck. There is no walk of shame where I'm from. Just a walk. <laughs> <Enjoy yourself. laughs> um, so, Jessica. Yes. You're right over there. Do not yeah. pit. Do not piddle yourself. Okay. <laughs> I won't. I won't. Okay. Good. I'm glad we got you from here up. Um, you just gave me a good visual of a walk of shame. Go on. <laughs> uh, social media. Where can we find you? Oh yes, thank you. So you can find me um, on Facebook. It's just Jessica Stern, like Howard Stern, but not rich or famous yet. Fingers crossed. Never know. Ao, positive vibes. And then Instagram. It's 
Hustlin Giggles, and um, the Giggles has a Z at the end. So Hustlin, H-U-S-T-L-I-N, Giggles with a Z at the end. Um, and that's my most important social media, media, excuse me. I had a website, but I recently took it down because I, I did. <laughs> I, I had one too, quarantine. and I took. I, I had a website too, and I took it down because four hundred dollars a year was just pricey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for hosting and, and everything. I kept the domain. I, am, I got rid of the hosting. Yeah, but I am that. I am that card bitch. I. I am. I am that girl with the with the cards at all my shows, just shamelessly self promoting myself. So yeah, um, and on those cards, it's just Jessica Stern on Facebook and. Um, instagram and that's about it um thank you so much for having me raj this is really Thanks dope i on. i read books about this i was ready to go on for a long time yeah. about females <laughs> in the history of comedy like i had bullet points and, and then, and then we, i like then where we, it went anyways cool. and that, that well i had the same vision too and it just it never fucking works out the way you want it to we just we end up it's going right. on tangents you know how we do it like, and you notice um, how the second you went off subject since we're fat fucks it went straight to ice cream and food love that <laughs> that's because we're fat and we're, we're there's no no shame still still no shame so oops, shit, I just dropped the wire so this is the yeti microphone get out of its sarcophagus Ugh. oh okay okay yeah i got this put it in my amazon cart that's the one I it's put got it in. it's got set you can mute the mic it's got, <coughs> it's got a built-in headphone jack on the bottom it's micro usb Okay. And it's got a, a, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. So you okay. can monitor, so you can hear the way it sounds as you're recording. You're not just shooting in the okay. dark. It's got the nice. controls on the other side. You can actually use this for different things. You can set it where it's records in stereo, where it's just condenser okay. from one side, 360. So it's different settings and you can set the gain on it all self-contained. So, you know, for okay. just starting out and the quality of the, of the microphone is fantastic. So, you know, for the you know, 120 bucks or whatever that it costs to get started. It's so mm -hmm. worth it. And you download, use Audacity, which is a free program to record audio. And you got between mm -hmm. this and Audacity, you have yourself a voiceover setup. You're, per you're, you're set. Okay. All right. I'm going I'm to order that in this evening. Yeah. So, and, and like I said, it's self-contained. It's everything you need to get started. As you get more and more jobs, you'll need to invest in better, better equipment, yeah. but that will at least get you going. Okay. So, yeah, and yeah, especially in LA, that. you guys have studios there. So it'll, that, you know, having studios accessible, a lot of times you send in the audition and you got to go to their studio to record me. Mm -hmm. I'm in Tampa. I have to have a full recording st studio in my house. So that's what I have. Right. Thank you for putting this on. My pleasure. Yeah, Kyle, where can we that. find you on the social media? Um, you, I'm on Instagram. It's Kyle Van Neely and, um, you can also search me on YouTube with that. I'm getting ready to relaunch. Uh, I got a lot of content coming to my YouTube right now. I just have my comedy uh, little special that I did, but I've got a lot of uh, videos that are uh, going to be hammered out on YouTube. So right now, just working on all of the, the technical aspects of stuff, the thumbnails and the editing and stuff. But um, that's where they can find me. Just You just type in Kyle Van Neely and it's going to pop up on all the Twitter and Instagram um, and YouTube right now as well, too. Awesome. Dennis, you want to share yours or? Um, yeah, I guess you can go to Facebook, Dennis Newman comedian slash actor. Kind of quiet right now, but when things get back to uh, normal, I'll be promoting my acting stuff. And we'll see where the comedy goes. There you go. Uh, as far as me, you can find me uh, at Real Roger Nelson on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Uh, also follow my podcast, the FUBAR Weekly Show. Uh, it's at FUBAR Weekly on all the social media platforms. Uh, and look for my TikTok coming soon, the Daily Motherfucker. Seriously, <laughs> if you stop it tonight, let me know because I will, I will – follow yeah, you yeah i'll have to, have to figure out how it works I, I might do that as like one i might do i might do one like actual channel and then just do one that's just the daily motherfucker <laughs> because why watch... the fuck not <laughs> it'll be a day you'll get a different motherfucker every day it's like you wake up you have breakfast what do you what am i gonna do oh let's see what roger's motherfucker of the day is Motherfucker. <laughs> all right you animals <laughs> all right i appreciate you guys coming on and, and doing this even though it didn't go the full direction uh, we wanted to it was still uh I still a good time. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, from our perspective, again, I apologize for Clark Brooks. Uh, you know, it didn't work out on his end, but uh, we did the best we could is, is what I got. But that big thanks to Clark. Uh, follow, look for Clark Brooks on, uh, on, on, on you, uh, Facebook. Uh, I think on Instagram, he's Clark Brooks 54, but check him out. Uh, Identity Tampa Bay uh, and Tampa News Force. Look for both of those. And uh, Clark is involved with both. He writes a, co- a comedy column every Wednesday for Identity Tampa Bay. Uh, aside from that, that's the show, guys. I really appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, Thank you. Great. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll do other things. Uh, actually, Dennis, I got to talk to you. I'm going to send you a message. I may have you on next week. Okay. Uh, different, different concept that's actually not comedy. Ooh. So, hey, <laughs> we'll diversify. All right, guys. Have Zoom a good night. I'm uh, It uh, is, yeah, but it's not well. the way you want it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids. Have a good night. I appreciate you guys coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, Thanks, yeah. watching oh, yeah. in the audience, I appreciate you guys. Have Thanks a good night. Don't forget to spay or neuter your children. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, it's it's offline. Guys, I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome.